Great. Um, I'd like to um, thank Alison and the other organizers for the in invitation to speak. Um, so um, I'm going to change gear a little bit, but not leaving the neuron quite yet. Um, I am going to um, talk about a relatively new project in my lab, um, which is to consider the lung from an angle that is not traditional. So traditionally, we think of the lung as a gas exchange organ. But um, recently, we got led by some surprising findings to consider the lung as a sensory organ. So what I show you on the background slide here is a section of the mouse lung um, outlined by green here, the airway. And these are the cells I'm going to talk about. These are little cluster of cells. So sometimes we consider them as, as organoids. And we think that they act uh, as sensors on the airway wall that allows the particular, particular um, function of, of the lung as a sensory organ. And I'm also going to touch upon um, uh, the, uh, to, to establish the, the point that these cells are a neuroimmune organoids that link the organ together with the nervous system and the immune system. Okay, so just a, a quick slide to justify what I'm thinking about. Um, the lung, as we all um, un, uh, would agree on, that functions in the context of many, many inputs. And some of these inputs might be cellular, for example, immune cells um, coming from the bone marrow either um, become residential or um, pass through the organ. And as the lung is exposed to the external aerosol environment, there are many um, sort of different inputs that could come in into the lung. So just as a, a piece of st a statistics, uh, a normal person sitting in a room like us, um, and on average, five to eight liters of air per minute passes in and out of the, the lung. So the air could be uh, vary in the content, so it could carry allergens, pollutants, increase or decrease in oxygen, and it could also change in air pressure uh, leading onto a different uh, stretch of the lung. So it's really not surprising to then consider the lung as a sensory organ, and the question that my lab has been interested in um, is how does the specificity set in? So for example, if you get allergen coming into the lung, oftentimes you develop an asthmatic-like response, whereas if you have a uh, consistent decrease in oxygen, oftentimes a person would develop uh, pulmonary hypertension or increasing blood pressure in the lung. So we got into this um, through that particular cell type I showed you on the first slide. Um, and these cells are called pulmonary neuroendocrine cells, which um, I'm sure some, many of you haven't heard of when we first got into it. We um, didn't know much about it. And part of the reason that this is a poorly understood cell type is because they're quite rare. So they represent less than 1% of the total cells in the lung. And they often form clusters, as I showed you on the top slide here, as well as here, um, that are called uh, neuroepithelial bodies. And they are the, uh, they're on the basal side are innervated by nerves. Um, so they are the only innervated uh, epithelial cells within the lung. So um, they are also interestingly preferentially localized to branch point junctions of the airway. It's a point that I'm gonna come back to later on. And it contains dense core vesicles with bioactive neuropeptide and amine. So it's kind of a, it's an epithelial cell type, but it has a lot of neuronal features to them. Okay. So another feature that um, has been uh, implicated um, is that they themselves can act as progenitor cells to derive other cells in the airway, as well as a progenitor cell niche to support another cell type that's on top of them to uh, function as progenitor cells. So the last point I'm gonna make here is that in the literature, there are actually many papers that um, show uh, pathologically an increase in number of PNECs as well as neuropeptides that are produced by these cells um, in many lung diseases. Some are rare diseases and some are more of, uh, common diseases. Essentially, majority of the lung diseases, there are those pathological findings associated with them. But it's not understood whether that um, these increases are actually uh, a result of the disease or contributing to the symptoms. So we got into this um, kind of really by accident uh, by studying a set of genes um, that are called roundabout or robo genes. These are receptor genes that are best known for their role in axon pathfinding. 
And we uh, were studying it in the lung, and uh, we were struck, uh, we were impressed by this particular gene expression pattern in that uh, robogenes are expressed in rare cluster of cells along the airway that are double stained by um, neuropeptides, indicating that these are neuro, uh, pulmonary neuroendocrine cells. Okay, so we were looking at uh, robomutant and its particular um, defect within the lung. After seeing this expression pattern, we looked at the neuroepithelial cells um, in the mutant setting as shown on the right columns here as three different stages of comparison to controls. So at embryonic day 13.5, um, when these cells are first arriving, um, they arrive in about the normal number compared to the control as well as they appear innovated. A um, couple of days later, when these cells start to cluster and form those little organoids in the control, in the mutant, what we found is that they never cluster. And that is a very highly penetrant phenotype that uh, continues into uh, postnatal stages and <coughs> onto adulthood, and that in the mutant we very rarely see clustering. So what we found is that as the result of this cellular phenotype, um, we have a, a change in gene expression. So uh, in particular here, we're asking for RNA level. Um, uh, nine of the neuropeptides are produced by those pulmonary neuroendocrine cells. And we found that many of them, in fact, five of them are increased in the mutant compared to the control. And in a lot of data that I won't have time to show you, um, we found that as a consequence of those neuropeptide increase, that leads to a profound increase of inflammation at baseline. So that's supported by transcriptome data of many um, uh, immune-related genes being upregulated in the mutant, as well as looking at immune cell staining in the lung, so in particular here, isob 4 stains a particular type of macrophages. Okay, so just a quick summary of what I've told you so far, um, along with uh, a, a number of uh, data that I didn't have time to show you, we found that robo uh, expressed um, in the pulmonary neuroendocrine cells uh, essential for the clustering, and that clustering event limits the amount of neuropeptides that they were produced, and that is res uh, important for keeping that baseline immune level down. Okay, and in the absence of robo, we have increased immune cells, and that um, leads to actually a structural damage in the lung that I didn't have time to show you about. But this also raised a hypothesis, which is that um, pulmonary neuroendocrine cells may serve as sensors, so little uh, like those uh, little um, thermometers uh, on, the, on, on the wall of the room that are wired at back, senses the temperature or uh, any input um, in, in the environment, and they report that through a circuit and uh, leading into a particular output into the lung. So this is a hypothesis we wanted to test, and we wanted to test in a loss of function setting. So to do that, um, so here on, I'm going to lead on to unpublished data. Um, what we did is to inactivate a transcription factor called acute skew like which is essential for the formation of pulmonary neuro neuroendocrine cells. So what I'm showing you here on the right-hand side here in the mutant is in the airway, um, the uh, Neuroendocrine cells, which are shown in, um, in the epithelial here, are completely absent, but the nerves that are um, normally innervating that still come close, but they do not intercalate into the epithelium because these cells are, are not there. These animals do live. Um, and uh, seemingly uh, okay at, uh, at room air, but when we challenge them in, uh, with allergen in a particular model of asthma um, using oval albumin, what we found is that in the control, um, normally this leads to a huge increase of goblet cells which produces mucus. Um, in the mutant, that response is much dampened. And by quantification, we found that th there is about 10% of the response left in the mutant compared to the control. So this goblet cell hyperplasia is one of the major outputs of the um, asthma phenotype. A major, another major output is uh, an increase in immune uh, cells infiltrating into the lung. So we tested that aspect in the mutant as well. 
So on the uh, left hand side, uh, side here, what you see is PBS controls. Um, so if we, uh, when we compare the mutant and the control, uh, looking at their um, innate lymphoid cells, Th2 cells, and eosinophils, we do not see a difference um, in the number of infiltrating cells into the lung. Whereas in the setting where we uh, challenge them with over in the allergen, we do see a profound difference between the mutant and the controlling all three of the immune cell types. And that's also reflected on the major cytokines that are involved in this Th2 um, immune response to allergen. So IL-5 and IL-13 are reduced in the mutant compared to the control. So this allows us to um, uh, put this skeletal pathway. And the next question we wanted to ask is what might be the direct cell type um, of effect as well as the effector molecules. So for this point, looking at cell types, I want to come back to that point that uh, pulmonary neuroendocrine <coughs> cells are preferentially reside um, at airway branch point junctions. So we asked what other immune molecules might be uh, near that region. And to that, we considered a uh, residential immune cell um, called um, an innate lymphoid cell group 2, or ILC2. Um, so that's outlined in pink here. Um, so through some uh, uh, statistical analysis that I won't have time to show you, we found that these cells are also preferentially localized at branch point junctions. As you can see here, there are two airways cross-sectioned, and, uh, and the, these pink cells are at airway branch point junctions. So it makes these cells as possible uh, direct target. So we wanted to test that. Um, to do that, um, we looked at uh, the gene expression of uh, the type of neuropeptides are ex specifically expressed uh, by the PNECs as well as whether the, uh, which one of their receptors are expressed in ILCs. So we um, narrowed down on two of the um, PNEC products, um, CGRP, which um, is a neuropeptide, as well as GABA, which is a neurotransmitter, and their receptors are very highly expressed in the ILCs. So to test whether they have an effect on the ILCs, we sorted the ILCs out, put them in culture, um, and put them in the context of um, both survival factors as well as initial inducers of um, activation, and add um, either GABA um, or CGRP on top of that, and assayed for IL, uh, of these cells IL-5 production as a way of their differentiation status. So what you can see on the left panel here, CGRP is able to induce further the differentiation, but uh, GABA is not able to. And I want to show you on the right hand side here, if we take away IL-33, CGRP is no longer able to induce that further maturation, suggesting that this initial induction by IL-33 is uh, required for this um, further induction um, activity of CGRP. Okay, so um, this uh, allow us to put CGRP in the picture here, and once the ILCs are activated, there are a, a, um, a, a abundance of literature suggesting that that is able to lead to further immune in, uh, infiltration, um, leading onto a full-blown full immune response. Okay, so I want to come back to the GABA because GABA, even though it has no effect on ILC2s, has a, a lot of support in the literature suggesting it's involved in, in, in asthma. So to address whether um, this could still be potentially acting downstream of PNECs, we inactivated um, either a GABA synthesizing enzyme or a GABA transporter in the airway and then tested their response um, to allergen. And what you can see here is that these, um, these mutants are really profoundly um, defective in their goblet cell hyperplasia response. There is no, uh, there's very little uh, blue cells in these airways compared to the control. Whereas on the right hand side here, when we look at the immune cells, um, in uh, confirming what we found in the in vitro system, um, these mutants are, are um, not defective in their immune cell response in response to the allergen. Okay, so this allows us to. Uh, sketch this into the pathway that PNEC acting through two different products leading onto uh, different aspects of the downstream response. 
So the last uh, piece of uh, data that I'm going to show you um, is a rescue experiment. So if these are important, uh, these uh, PNEC products are important, can we rescue the lack of PNECs using those products? And um, this is on the right hand panel here. We're instilling a mixture of CGRP and GABA into the acute like mutant, as you can see here. It very nicely rescued um, the goblet cell hyperplasia phenotype, and shown on the right hand side here, uh, it very uh, nicely rescued the immune cell phenotype as well. Okay, so um, just to summarize what um, I told you, um, I showed you some of the data supporting these, uh, this uh, pathway that uh, we are arriving at. Um, in that um, PNECs, even though it's a very rare cell type, we think um, it is critical for allergic, allergic asthma responses, and it's acting through different products in, um, through different pathways, um, recapitulating the full response in the lung. And, um, that PNEC acting um, through ILCs, and both of them can preferentially localized to the branch point junctions, and that partnership is important for this full-blown response. So um, we wanted to understand why these cells need to be there at branch point junctions. And we got more of an idea um, when I saw a um, paper from um, David Stoltz's lab where they did uh, computer simulations of um, particles coming into the airway, and uh, this is not going to let me run it. Sorry. Oh. I was still too. Okay, here we go. Great, thanks. Um, all right, so particles coming into the airway, and there are ciliated cells in the airway that fan those particles out, okay? So in a bit, you'll see steady state where those particles are um, finally enriched at or stuck at, and you can see here, many of those red dots are places where they're stuck at, and they're enriched at branch point junctions. Okay, so this was uh, very exciting for us. And I want to come back to my slides. Okay, where we propose that um, these neuroendocrine cells and ILCs come together um, and they're enriched at branch point junctions where particles get stuck at. So it's an opportunistic site where this organoids um, can very effectively sense this um, and perhaps either through their um, own um, secreted product or through their uh, wired um, neural circuit come back and mount a response that is both specific and very powerful and effective. Okay, so I want to leave, it, leave you with that thought um, and thank the people who did the work I presented. So Kelsey Branchfield uh, worked on the RoboMutant um, and Peng Fei Shui, who is a po uh, current postdoc who's working on the uh, Akiskewed Mutant. And I'd like to thank my collaborators and funding, and thank you for listening. Questions? So, Lindsay Hink, who I know who worked on Robo and Slick and the Mary Group. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know if there are neuroendocrine cells in the mammary gland. Mammary gland. I don't know much about it, but yeah. in prostate, clearly, in progression to androgen cascade resistance prostate cancer, yep. that's the main phenotype you see. Yeah, so a friend of mine, Chad Vazina, um, at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, where I just moved from, so he's looking at that. Uh, using our mutants right now. So I don't know the answer to that. Um, but the intestine do have endocrine cells as well. Um, um, interestingly, so the endocrine cells in the intestine, my understanding is they don't really cluster. Um, so I don't know if robo would play a role, but I would, I would expect that those endocrine cells um, in sensing the environment will play a similar role 
in the other organs like the intestine as well. I also have a question. So you showed that several steps on the pathways regulated by certain cytokines, right? Yeah. I mean, how specific are those? Uh, so they how are specific are yeah. the downstream cytokines? In, uh, in towards the cell-to-cell -cell communication, I mean, are they going just in one direction or they are uh, exchanging between the cell types? Um, you mean downstream of the innate lymphoid cells or right. between the pulmonary neuroendocrine cells and the immune cells? In, in, in both cases. Right. So um, I know more about the, what's in between the pulmonary neuroendocrine cells and the immune cells. So I'll tell you that aspect. So the signals that I told you about is mostly coming from the uh, neuroendocrine cells to immune cells. We think that through that piece of data I showed you on the IL-33 being important for that priming effect um, for the pulmonary neuroendocrine cell product to work, we think there is a signal that's upstream. So going from allergen to something to PNEC, so that something is a signal from immune cells, but we don't know quite what it I is see. yet. But it's a great, great point. Thanks. There is one question over there. Um, yeah. Do you have any implications for ILC3s uh, having crosstalk with PNECs? Yeah, so we have not looked at it ourselves. Um, we'd love to. Um, my understanding from ILC3 um, regulation in the lung um, so far it's understood as a innate like a back uh, a, a microbe induced uh, cell type but that's something that we are um, talking to Victor Nizé on campus here to to try to test thank you all right if no more questions uh, thank you again son